Thank you. That's a really hearty welcome. We appreciate it. I hope everybody had a good morning uh, and a wonderful lunch. My name is Alejandra Valarino Boyer. I am the director of the Ravinia Staines Music Institute, and I'm also the founder of BIPOC Arts, which is an online database for BIPOC opera professionals. I am delighted to be here to moderate the conversation, Please Don't Go, which centers our conversation around what organizations can do to retain black and Latina leaders that they have hired. I am joined today by three fantastic humans and leaders who will share their experience and insight with us on this topic. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves briefly and to give us a little insight into the lens and perspectives uh, through which they're entering this conversation. You can learn more about them through the Hopin app and page. The resumes are there. They are very impressive, so I do recommend that you read them. And for those of you who are joining us virtually, you can also uh, use the app to enter in your questions. Just click on that Q&A tab, and we have somebody here who will, reach, who will read out your questions to us. So Wayne, I'm going to start with you, if you can introduce yourself to us. Certainly. I'm Wayne S. Brown, he, him, and his. And I'm just delighted to uh, be here. I am the president and CEO of Detroit Opera. Uh, and uh, I'm just thrilled to witness those who are here representing so many organizations, individuals, both in place and also virtually, who've joined this session on this 25th anniversary of Sphinx. I believe that this topic today has been actually made reference to throughout uh, so far, and so we'll add a, hopefully a little twist to uh, the conversation that uh, will uh, take place. I'd like to add not only about retention, but we cannot uh, back off from uh, the invitation, the attraction to be able to engage so that our pool can continue to expand and we can find rightful places uh, in the field. Thank you. <laughs> Sharnita. Hi, I'm Sharnita Johnson. And first and foremost, I'm a very proud Detroiter. And happy to be home, um, happy to be with you. And I was also a very early funder of the Sphinx organization when it started. Um, I was a program officer with the State Arts Council at the time. So it's just an organization that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I come to this conversation as a black woman in philanthropy in the nonprofit sector. Um, before I was uh, in the philanthropy field, I was a fundraiser. And in both spaces, I was often the only person of color um, in the room, in the conversation, and it has definitely influenced um, my work. I am currently the Vice President of Strategy, Impact, and Communications with the Victoria Foundation in Newark, New Jersey. And prior to that, I was the Arts Program Director for the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, also in New Jersey. Um, and I spent a number of years in philanthropy in Michigan and in Detroit, um, in Flint with the Ruth Mott Foundation, in Detroit with the Kellogg Foundation and the Skillman Foundation. So I've had a really um, interesting um, career and opportunity to um, really see how the philanthropy world and the nonprofit world um, has um, really changed over a lot of years. I'm not going to tell you how many years because I've <laughs> aged myself. Um, but it's really interesting. Sphinx has made such an impact, um, but we know that there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and I'm happy that we can continue to have these conversations. Thank you. And Yvette. Hi, everyone. I'm Yvette Loinas. I'm the Director of Artistic Administration at Opera Theater of St. Louis in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm also a very proud alumni of the Sphinx Lead Program, Cohort 2. Um, <laughs> as um, Sharnita beautifully said, I think also Sphinx for me, um, the impact not only in our fields, um, but for me personally, um, as I step into this conversation, being someone who also transitioned and had a big leap and stretch in my career uh, during the pandemic, um, being the only um, person of color, Latina, in, in the leadership team um, and in the broader field of opera and artistic administration, being a woman and just stepping into spaces where I am the only one and, 
and the burdens of, of carrying um, both my identity and my skill and my talent into the room is when I'm really looking forward to talking and sharing here up on stage. Excellent. Thank you all so much for those introductions. And before we dive into our discussion, I just wanted to set um, set us up for this conversation with a little bit more context. So, as you know, the title of this session is Please Don't Go, which if you were in the Show Me the Money um, session, Afton um, referred to it and thought, uh, kind of uh, compared it to that feeling of being in an organization, thinking like, oh my gosh, I've got to figure out how I stay here, right? And so she so perfectly articulated what was kind of rubbing me a little bit wrong with that idea. And I kind of really want to call this session, Why Should I Stay? Right? This is about why am I going to stay here and work for your organization? And so, <laughs> get ready, y'all. Okay, so, you know, we've, <laughs> in recent years, we've seen the appointment of black and Latina leaders uh, in key leadership roles. And usually, this is with an explicit or implicit mandate to bring about some kind of change. And it's not just within the arts, right? We're seeing this across many other industries. And however, once these leaders are in place, they often find that they're not supported or given any agency to actually bring about that change. And if we look back even further, right, to the term, some of you might know, the glass cliff, that was coined back in 2005 and came out of some research that showed that women and people of color were actually overrepresented in positions of leadership in companies in crisis. Right, so they were bringing in women and leaders of color into organizations whose foundations were already faulty and shaky, and they were somehow magically supposed to be able to fix it. And when they didn't or couldn't, it was solely that individual's fault. Last year, there was a study by uh, MIT Sloan that details the five toxic culture attributes that drive attrition. And so they did this research um, and found that a toxic workplace really was a key indicator for attrition during the six months of this great resignation that happened right post-pandemic. Um, and they wanted to define that a little bit more. And what they found were there were five attributes to that toxic work workplace culture. It was disrespectful, non-inclusive, unethical, cutthroat, and abusive. And though we may talk about some of those in this conversation, I think we're really focusing in on that non-inclusive part of it, which they also found of all of those topics, that non-inclusive piece of it was the biggest um, indicator for employees to name their organization as toxic, was that it was a non-inclusive space. And I think most of us know that this impacts women even more. And in 2022, Lean In did a, work, a study on women in the workplace that showed that women were leaving their organizations at a far higher number um, than men um, and men of color, especially women of color, were leaving at a higher number. And so they had three reasons for that, right? Women leaders wanted to advance. Actually, there's, there's great statistics about the ambition of women far exceeding that of men, um, but that they face greater challenges. Two is that women leaders were overworked often because they were taking on additional DEI tasks, all right, not being paid for them and being under uh, recognized for them. And then three, women leaders wanted a better work culture. And then we have to name intersectionality and understand how that also comes into play. Gender, um, age, queer identities, disability. So what are we gonna do about it? What's to be done? What can organizations do and must they do uh, when they hire leaders of color to have a culture and an environment that allows those leaders to thrive and for their organizations to thrive? And I'm gonna start, Yvette, with you on this question. I just mentioned the great resignation. But I think we need to identify a little bit how this is different for black and Latina leaders. And you were recently quoted in a really fantastic article, uh, which is linked on the page, the conference app page, um, about the specific issue of women leaders of color leaving um, arts organizations. So I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit from your perspective, what is different between this umbrella topic of the great resignation? What's different about this for black and Latina leaders? Yeah. So. I mean, this study that you quoted about the reasons people, women are leaving, I definitely resonate for me. Um, added to that, um, being black or Latinx in identity, um, stepping into an organization, for me, the difference is that that's personal, right? That's who we are. And 
while we're leaving organizations because we want to better our careers, we want a, the professional development, we want that stretch, um, stepping in, identifying um, as an underrepresented identity in the room, it's hard not to make that personal. And so the emotional burden that we are, that I, I, we've heard talk in this conference a little bit as an option, doesn't feel optional to me um, when I step into the room, particularly being the only identity of those intersectionalities. So I think that's something that, um, you know, some of our colleagues don't have to think about or aren't expected to think about in the same way. Yeah. Shanita Lane. Um, I totally agree. I wanted to do some snaps here for that. Um, <laughs> because absolutely, if you are in a workplace and you want to bring your full self, however, you're the only person of color, you're de facto sort of representing that whole community. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something that I think is um, really unhealthy. Um, and also thinking about sometimes we become sort of the de facto DEI people only because we're saying, we're looking at our work and saying, I don't see black or Latinx people represented here or BIPOC people represented here. So let's have this conversation. And if you're lifting up the conversation, then it becomes, oh, well, can you co-chair the DEIA? <laughs> no, I cannot. That's like, <laughs> you do that. I will participate. I will share my resources. I will agitate. But no, that's your problem to solve. I'll approach the question slightly differently. Please. Um, I was appointed uh, President and CEO of Detroit Opera in 2014. Just completed my ninth year. And I recall that the, there was a press conference set up, and uh, the, uh, the founder of the organization, Dr. David DiChiara, uh, asked whether or not I would object uh, to, uh, as part of the introduction, to be able to say that Wayne Brown is the first African-American to lead Detroit Opera, or in that case, with Michigan Opera Theater. I said, no, I don't want that. Uh, Wayne Brown was appointed to the uh, president and CEO of Detroit Opera, um, and, uh, and let others comment in terms of my race. Um, my point being that it's important to recognize when you can influence the conversation, mm. when you can influence the, the, the nature of the message. Because I don't want to walk into a room from a perspective of he's a black American, and therefore, what does that mean? Um, I want to be able to, as I'm reminded of the master class, I would say, that was given by uh, yesterday with Denise Graves and Damien Snead, which was just wonderful. It was a master class for all of us. And that has to do, you must contribute to the story that's being told. You must take ownership. You must assert. You don't want to take a defensive position. You want to take an offense position. Uh, because ultimately, that can indeed uh, uh, put you in a much stronger position, I believe. Uh, there have been many times. I've been doing this for a while. Uh, there have been many, many times. I was the only African American in the room. And uh, it was important that, uh, that I uh, didn't bring race into the, into the room. It was important for me to bring myself, the skills, the perspective, and hopefully uh, uh, the leadership uh, to influence uh, dialogue. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I think that's part of the, um, if I'm hearing sort of the, um, perhaps a bit of a dichotomy, right, with um, Yvette's comments is um, sometimes we're not able to, to change the story of the room, right? We can only bring um, what we have into the space. And so when we're talking about that, um, the, the retention of leaders, especially of black and Latina leaders, um, the organization does have a part to play in what, that, um, what they've built around that. Um, whether you want to come in as your full self without your racial identity attached, or if you're walking into a space with whatever part of your identity is attached, whether you meant for, you, for it to be attached or not, right? Um, and I think that's part of what we're hoping we can get to 
um, with uh, these conversations and as we move forward. So I was recently listening to a podcast uh, with Lisa Leahy, who is a professor at Harvard, I believe, and she co-authored a book called Immunity to Change. And it's all about kind of goal setting and getting to those goals and making those changes more on an individual level. But one of the things that she said in uh, part of the conversation she's talking about her work is that for the most part, people, they're genuine about wanting that change, right? They're genuine about that goal they set, like, I really do want to go to the gym more often, right? Like, we really mean it when we say it. We don't really get there, but, you know, we mean it when we say it. And I was listening to that, thinking about this conversation. I thought, well, you know, I think that's really true, too, for most organizations. I think for the most part, organizations do want to be inclusive. They want to have their people succeed. And so part of her work and what she says is we don't do enough of that background work, right? We go immediately into problem solving. We go into that action bias. Okay, great, we're gonna diversify our staff by 50%. But we never talk or look back at why that's been a problem, right? We never do that kind of um, uh, assessing all those issues. So I thought maybe for part of this conversation, what we could do is do that kind of assessment, right? So we'll take the assumption that these organizations, they really do mean well. They really um, want to be inclusive, inclusive spaces. What are some of the parts of the organization, the people in the groups in the organization, who need to understand that they are part of the success or failure of this, right? Of ensuring that they have uh, a culture and an environment where black and Latina leaders can do their best work. And Sharnita, I wanted to start with you because you're coming from the philanthropic world and when we spoke in our call, you said very clearly, like this is also happening in my field. So I'm curious from your perspective, if you're kind of dissecting um, organizations, what are the different um, moving pieces that are really critical to this? So I think, you know, you have to sort of look at, and I'll take this through uh, the lens of nonprofit because that's where I've spent most of my career. So nonprofits have boards, um, they have staff, and so it has to come from the top. It has to come from board leadership, that it is a priority, that, um, that it is a value, um, and that, um, you know, I've just found over the years, and I think that you're absolutely correct, that folks do mean well, um, and they are really earnest in wanting to see this change or make this change, but when you get to the point of people feeling uncomfortable, particularly when you take a look at sort of the history of an organization, um, and if there's just a stark lack of um, <coughs> diversity on boards, on the staff, in programming, et cetera, you, d you have to look at that, you have to examine it. And not in a way of shame and blame, that's not effective necessarily, but you do have to understand why is this the case? You know, why are we not attracting a diverse board or why are we not retaining diverse staff? Um, and it's an important question for the organization to ponder, but it has to be a question from the top at every level of an organization. And it has to be continually um, examined over time. Um, and you know, it's not you read a book, you did a training, and now we're there. <laughs> like it is just a constant ongoing learning. We're always constantly learning. New information is coming at us in different ways, new experiences, and you're never done. You're just never done. Yeah, that's very true. Yvette? Yeah, I mean, for me, it. I think we have to start internally and from, from like really looking at the processes and the, and the barriers that are keeping people out. I think in the arts, we've all quickly gone to diverse casting, um, making sure that we are as colorful on stage and in programming as we can be, which in, to me is the low hanging fruit. It's a thing we should have been doing and some organizations have been doing for longer than just this moment. Um, but really the work that's longstanding, the work that will really change is looking at like what is keeping people out? What, where are the decisions being made within an organization? How do you bring more perspectives into that space? It's the culture, it's the way we work, it's the way we um, communicate that I think we've all gotten comfortable, particularly in the workplace, particularly organizations that have long tenured staff. You know, It's really hard to come in and try to affect change. And we are being programmed in a way in this moment to come in and be the change, to come in with all the ideas that are gonna solve all the problems. And 
I can certainly, on a personal level, relate to that, just wanting to be such a positive impact for the organization, for the field, but just understanding that change is hard. And, and humans that have their way of working, and, and it's been working, and it's been you know, the thing that built the company and the reputation, um, to have to have that conversation about, well, this is actually a process that's keeping people out. Just hiring, for example, um, for me in the artistic space, posting positions. It's not groundbreaking, it's not like, oh my gosh, genius idea, but it has absolutely changed the, the way we engage um, at Opera Theater of St. Louis, in the artistic space in particular. Um, it's a lot of work, um, <laughs> posting every single job, reviewing applications, even reviewing the process of how you bring people into an interview process. Um, but it, I'm really proud of that work because it's been able to bring people that are not necessarily within the network uh, that we're used to hiring from. And that's part of you know, the arts. We all hire from the, the places and spaces we know. But if you're not a part of that space, how do you ever get in? And how do you ever rise? So I think th there's a lot to unpack there, but um, <laughs> it's, it's the work you do inside. Yeah, fantastic. And when you are, you are the head, you are the, you're the top, right, of your organization, when you're thinking about um, creating a space where you can retain this top talent that, you've, um, that you have in place that you really believe in. Um, it's you, who else? What are the other parts of the organization that are really vital to ensuring that, um, that that culture is in place? Well, as the CEO of the organization, it's my responsibility to, to uh, take the lead and to make sure that the culture of the organization is, is re reflects the, the time. Uh, Detroit Opera, for many years, under the founder of the organization, had a commitment to making sure that, uh, a little background, Michigan Opera Theater was established in 1971, four years following the race riots in Detroit. Uh, the founder wanted to make sure that opera played a key role in the revitalization of the city. He wanted to make sure that the cast uh, where members of the audience could see themselves on the stage. Mm -hmm. Seeing uh, Denise Graves here uh, last night was just a reminder of the early years of our company. Uh, Denise Graves wasn't engaged just once or twice, became a regular participant for about four years straight. Leona Mitchell, who had an incredible uh, experience with Metropolitan Opera, spent multiple years here. Uh, the whole notion of uh, an uh, assistant stage manager, a, a former classmate of mine, Preston Terry, was in the role of a stage manager uh, in the late 70s. And so when the whole notion of about three years ago started to service, particularly following George Floyd's death, the whole notion of whether or not we were going to start to devote our time and attention mm -hmm. to DE&I, um, for me, it wasn't a matter of starting. It was a matter of for an organization that's demonstrated a commitment, what steps were we going to take to deepen our commitment to make sure that we're not resting on our laurels but could find very clear examples? So we looked at the whole notion of traditional work and uh, with our appointment of Yuval Sharon as our artistic director, uh, we said, let's make sure that we have a new director, perhaps uh, a female director who has never uh, led uh, uh, an, uh, an opera before, so Kanesha Shaw uh, took on the role, known for the th in the theater world, <coughs> and something she was always interested in, but not necessarily having had that opportunity to work in the opera field, mm -hmm. to be able to do just that. Uh, the whole notion in terms of conductor, the whole notion in terms of, of, of board participation, leadership uh, in the senior staff, in our, in our HR director, etc. It's about taking that look and say, how can we continue to make, take a deeper dive? And I think it's an ongoing process. And I think there's, it's twofold. There's a leadership responsibility uh, for, for, for setting the, making sure that the culture is reflective, not open, but inviting, nurturing, and making sure that when uh, someone arrives that there's an onboarding process, there's a buddy the system, uh, to make sure that there are not expectations that have been suggested but are not realized. And likewise, in terms of the individual who comes into the organization, it's important that as you prepare for the auditions, that you're also preparing uh, uh, in, uh, in an ensemble, 
that you're also preparing for what's going to be required to be part of an administrative team of an organization like an opera company, which is not necessarily traditionally uh, when you think about diversity uh, by any means. But it's something that uh, we can do, uh, and it requires the responsibility of the individual applying to make sure that, uh, that, that, that there are no surprises or to, or to temper the surprises so that they know what to expect, what not to expect, and also convey expectations. Uh, it's better to convey that early on than after, after, once you're in a position and find yourself reacting. So contribute to what that cultural outcome might be. Yeah, that's good. The, the, you're reminding me of uh, this story that um, I heard from an arts leader who had gone through the interview process um, for a position, a high um, leadership position for an organization, and the hiring committee had, you know, set a certain expectation uh, for her. And when she walked in, she came to realize that that committee was actually not at all represented by the board's idea of what was gonna happen and their expectation, right? So she was really walking into a, quite a uh, dangerous, I would maybe say, right? Um, situation where the board was expecting one thing, the hiring committee had set up an expectation for her to do another thing, and I think that speaks a lot to what you're saying. And also to this, um, the, the framework that I was mentioning earlier with Lisa Leahy, one of the things that she asks too is, what are the things that we're doing or not doing that get in the way of meeting these goals, right? And so, Let's maybe drill down a little bit more when we're talking about these leadership positions. Oftentimes there is a committee, um, whether that's a board committee, some kind of hiring committee to bring in these leaders. You know, what are they doing to get in the way um, or what are they not doing that is really setting up these leaders to walk into an organization and not be successful? Before, we'll, and we'll get to the good stuff. We'll get to the how do we then flip that over, I promise. But I think it's, it's good to just kind of name these things and identify them. So I can jump in. Um, so what are they not doing? I mean, I think it's how we, like, what does support look like for this particular hire, right? Um, it's not, I mean, just the basic things that you would do and that Wayne was just talking about, like setting expectations and being really clear about the culture, not masking it, you know, with the very positive things. I think that would be really helpful in terms of just be, having open conversations with your candidates so that expectations on both sides are, there are surprises that would really rattle someone for wanting to exit, you know, quickly after coming in. Um, but for me, it's more about investment. Um, so once you've brought someone in, yes, support, right? Give them the resources to do their job, give them the space, give them the time, uh, which I know is such a luxury these days in particular but just give them the space so that they can come in and take up the space that you want them to. Um, but then really invest, right? Like back them up, be at their side, like give them the space to make those decisions. Um, I think that's a piece that, I don't know how to articulate that um, in a way that um, doesn't sound like it's somehow missing from the process in some places, because I do think companies invest, I mean, the second that you get an offer, <laughs> that's an investment in you and your career. But it's more about like walking with you, um, and, and especially with the challenges that we're dealing with as BIPOC leaders in the space. In this moment that is calling on us, right? Like the expectations there, and how do we set up better boundaries? Because that's what we're talking about, the lack of boundaries and the transition in the way that we work that now folks want balance. Folks want to feel valued, intellectually respected, you know, yes, for my whole self, my identity, my intersectionality, the fact that I'm a mother, you know, like the fact that I bring so much other things into the conversation. Um, when we're talking about essentially connecting and communicating with people through the arts, right? Um, I would love to have those conversations across departments, across organizations, about how we are thinking about investing in people so that they can succeed, right? So that there, our success is the company's success, is the community's success. And I don't know how much time and thought is put into that once you've hired the person. It's like a win, yes, now get to work. <laughs> <laughs> but like, there is so much more to it, right? To integrating someone as a thought leader in your organization. 
um, to making sure that their ideas are heard and valued and integrated, right? You know, and you don't have to take every idea that we put forward. But I think another piece of this that I talk about a lot is just listening, right? Like actively listening and making sure that you're creating space, you know, particularly from leadership at the top. Sometimes, you know, I think they are called on, you know, making the big decisions and bringing in the right people to do the job. Um, but I think there's room in certain organizations to, to really ask questions and, and be more collective in, your, in bringing in people's ideas and, and being guided, you know, particularly in the challenging times. You know, I don't know if this is an answer to your That's question. Okay. <laughs> you know, it just occurs to me, and I appreciate what you said um, about the announcement. So this notion that we're still at this point having the first ever, particularly in sort of some older legacy organizations, is like we have to stop normalizing that. It should be normal that, in a, particularly in a city like Detroit that is predominantly black, that we would have leaders of color across all sectors. Um, and so that is the thing that I think we sort of have to start to, um, to impact and to unpack mm -hmm. is why at this juncture are there um, so few people of color in leadership across sectors. Um, and I don't, like I said, I don't have an answer to that, but I just think it's important for us to start to examine, particularly in legacy organizations. Absolutely, I agree with that. And I think that's part of that organization's work before bringing in a leader of color. If this is the very first time and you're looking around the table and the rest of your leaders are white, I mean, you really do need to ask yourself, why is this the case? And address that before you bring somebody in and then have them, you know, figure out or have to deal with the repercussions of that. One has to also keep in mind that unless you're going to fire a lot of people, there are only going to be so many positions that are going to be open at any given time. Uh, and that's, that's just to say that, um, that it's, it's going to take a bit of time to bring about that kind of sh significant shift in profile. When I think about the role that Sphinx uh, initiated 25 years ago when, when uh, Aaron Dworkin took a profile of the entire field of orchestras and made the observation that about 2% of the, of the orchestra personnel were, were people of color. Uh, and uh, the work that Sphinx has done and has represented in this room and also uh, virtually uh, and creating so many nurturing programs, opportunities and coaching and, and um, opportunities to, uh, to, uh, to have a state of readiness, right? Because it's not, it's not necessarily about the specific skills that one brings to, uh, uh, to an audition, for example, but perhaps that same area in terms of the administrative track, the whole notion of uh, perhaps uh, trying out uh, uh, before you go into an audition, uh, uh, being a, a hiring uh, opportunity to get some feedback. So you're not uh, operating in isolation, operating uh, 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 appropriately. But it's, um, it's, it's something that uh, we must be committed to. It's going to take time. And when you look about in 25 years, what, has, what a difference Sphinx has made, but that doesn't mean there is not so much more work to be done. And uh, we, we just have to be steadfast and uh, look for the opportunities where they are and, and encourage and provide feedback and make sure we're paying attention once people are hired to get a sense of job satisfaction. Mm -hmm. uh, because job satisfaction, we want to make sure we're, we're, we're taking the initiative. We're not reacting to a problem. We want to make sure that, 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 that our colleagues are feeling a sense of acknowledgement and, and satisfaction. So they don't have to entertain the notion. Do I want to stay? It's not a matter of whether you want to stay. You know, the question is, can you find fulfillment in these roles? And if not, why not? And what, can, as leaders, what can we do to make sure that that sense of fulfillment is there? Yeah. And I'm hearing so many echoes uh, for those of you who are in the 
panel this morning in her voices, uh, one of the panelists, uh, Angelica Cortez, was saying that a lot of the asking the why and just constantly challenging those assumptions that you have, and I feel like we're talking about that so much here, of just asking yourself why, um, both from the organization who's looking to make the hire um, and also the person who is interviewing, right, um, and uh, really assessing that um, and asking those questions. So I'm going to turn our conversation now then to those folks who are um, uh, interviewing for these positions, right, to all of these incredible black and Latina leaders that we know are um, walking into um, these interviews and are being courted um, by these organizations. What are some of the things, and when you were mentioning this earlier, what are some of the things that they can do, that we can do to assess an organization? Um, you know, whether it's those calls to colleagues or the questions that we can ask in the space to test out, you know, a, do they really mean what they say? Or are they just trying to do this big, bold act with not having done any of the work um, that really needs to come with it? Um, what uh, advice, what um, other things do you think um, need to, um, questions need to be asked through that process? Do your homework. <laughs> yes. I mean, when you think about the number of people who are in this room, many of whom perhaps you're meeting for the very first time, or that you're seeing again for the 20th time, uh, create a buddy system. Uh, make sure that you, if you, if those with whom you have a very special relationship, you know, find out what's going on in a particular community. What's going on in a particular organization? I'm thinking about uh, throwing my hat into the ring for a particular position. Um, give me feedback of, of, of what do you think I should be considering. When I think about my, my own career, I uh, began with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra many years ago, and, uh, and, and, and when I think about the conferences and orchestras that I would attend, and, and uh, that not only was I interested in the, in the very specific conference agendas, but I was interested also in seeing four or five people with whom I had a very special relationship. It was not about size of organization, it was about where are, where are the, where's their common interests. And I know what particular skills I was bringing to the conversation, and I had three or four other people who had different skills. And we made a point of, of getting together uh, periodically to be supportive of one another, to test our ideas, uh, to con share confidences, and that was, a, that was my own system for growing. And I would say, when you think about a particular opening in an organization, uh, getting a sense of who's there, who's been there, uh, uh, what, uh, what's the perception of the organization internally and externally, so that when you go into the room, you have better insight more than just what's been published in terms of a particular announcement. Control, the, contr add your influence to the space so when you arrive for the point of, a, of audition or hiring uh, that uh, you can uh, offer your own influence. Great. Um, I, I would love to just, um, yes, yeah, speak to that question. But before I, I lose this train, um, because I do know for a lot of us as we're um, applying for these, you know, or for those who are searching, um, when you're going into an organization, or you know, if, if you are the only person, and or if there are organizations that are predominantly white and there aren't positions, I think about like what could we do as an organization, if that's your organization, to really set up the space. Because sometimes the answer is always, oh, let's diversify the staff, and let's bring in diversity, and that's great. And I always, I think that is absolutely necessary, but not, not before you create the space, right? Mm -hmm. Because that is part of the problem, right? You bring in people, and the space is not inclusive. The space, regardless of the identities in the room, hasn't been prepared with a culture that brings people in and is a space of belonging. So to my advice to those in these searches, try to figure out in the ways that you can with questions directly um, to invite transparency about the culture of the organization. Because most of the time in interview processes, you're, hear you're hearing the positive. You're hearing the why they want you. And it's, but it's also an interview for you, right? It's not necessarily, um, you know, we all go into those, um, <laughs> events, really pitching ourselves and wanting to get the offer. Um, and then even 
you know, you might get the offer, but through the process have discovered, wait a minute, this is not the culture or the place that I want. And I want to empower everyone in this room, if you're in that situation, that it's okay to say no. Just like it's okay to walk away. Because it's not, you know, no, you're not going to damage your reputation. No, you're not going to, I mean, this is very, my, my very humble opinion. <laughs> Because that's, it's, otherwise you're setting yourself up for some of the challenges that we're talking about where you feel stuck, you feel alone, you feel like you can't really do the work that you were expecting to do. So really understanding the culture of how decisions are made in an organization. If you're stepping into a leadership position as a department head or you know, someone that's gonna be able to, to you know, apply and use the resources of the organization, like are you gonna be allowed to do so? Are you going to be backed up not just by your uh, direct manager, but by the board, by the, the different constituents that you're going to be um, uh, working with in the organization? It's not easy to do, so I would definitely like plan your questions and hopefully the rapport with the your you know whoever would be the direct manager, um, you could figure that out in that process, and definitely go to people who've worked in organizations before, because um, and why did they leave? And why did the person directly holding the position before leave? And is that okay for you? You know, I don't think that investigative work is, is um, um, should be looked uh, down on or, or, and, or you should definitely take the time to do it. And even if the person's not within your network, find the connection. Because I have never had anyone turn me down to talk to me about their experience at an organization that I had or have been exploring. Yeah, that's so. such great advice. I've, I, yeah. I, have seen that more and more, and I'm with you. Please do that. Um, I, there is no nothing to be ashamed of in picking up the phone um, and asking for that. And unfortunately, we don't have more time, but maybe there's like another panel discussion at some point, or maybe that's just a conversation you can have at Fuel, right, of this thing of like, can you say no to a job? Let's unpack what that means, mm, right. especially for people of color, especially for immigrants, like to say no to a job and how that really, how we work against ourselves for that. Um, feel free to pop that in the Q&A. Um, but speaking of Q&A, it is time for us to um, go to that part of our conversation. Uh, so we will hear from anybody who um, has asked a question um, virtually. And those of you here in the room, there are microphones on both sides where you can ask a question. Hi, my name is Anne Crewall. I'll be reading some questions from Hoppin. This one is, how long should I stay in a role in an organization that says it is committed to change but is making good steps at a slothful pace? Who's slothful? Not that long. Not that long. <laughs> Not that long. Um, set up what you have to set up, but um, because there's always this notion of we can do it at some other, like next, and it just never happens um, unless there is sort of a big upset. So, and I can appreciate that this, as I said before, you know, this, um, this work and culture building takes time, um, but there's also stalling. Can I also add to that too, that I think it's okay for somebody else to reap the benefits of your time at a place. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I've certainly come across that in my own work, so just getting to the point of saying, you know what, it's okay. I don't need to get the benefit of this slow pace. Let this next person who's gonna come in five years from now, after they've gone through this very slow change, um, and just just really um, being okay with that. But I mean, I'm with Sharnita, don't, don't wait too long. It's not worth it to yourself. Right. Yeah. Hi, my name is Natalie. Um, I think my question is probably along the same lines, but what if, um, you know, you go through the interviewing process and they're interviewing you, you're interviewing them, and um, they talk about all the visions and the values and you find yourself being in agreement with that, but then when you start the job, it almost seems like a lot of what was discussed in the interviewing process is not um, equaling to what you're seeing in that um, as you're working, you know, or starting the job. So I guess, what kind of um, advice could you offer someone in that kind of situation? Because it would look bad to, you know, start a job and then you immediately uh, quit right after, because then that kind of says so much maybe about the person too, maybe or maybe not, I don't know. But I guess what kind of advice could you offer to someone who may be in that kind of situation? 
raise your hand, mm -hmm. you know, call, call it out, mm -hmm. and do it early on because particularly you have more ability to influence next steps once you're hired than once you've been there six, seven, eight months. So if you're, if, and I would encourage, approach it from a matter of clarification. You know, you, you, uh, during the interview process, you had a sense that certain uh, directions were being taken. And if you are experiencing something that's contrary, that's your time to seek clarification. You'll, you'll lose more time to influence next steps the longer you wait. Thank you. I think we have a question on this side here. Hi. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Danielle Williams. I'm director of education at ORCIDS, and so um, there's a lot of opportunities to to meet new teaching artists and, and you know we have interviews for positions on a pretty regular basis. And I'm wondering if you have any um, any questions that you've either asked, you know, when you're interviewing new employees or that you've heard that kind of make that, even from the initial um, interview process, kind of make that space open and address those questions, kind of prompts or something if the candidate, you know, isn't bringing that I want to be able to create that kind of space where questions and um, everything that you're discussing can be shared and, and openly discussed. Thank you. I like to ask the question of um, how feedback works in an organization to understand, like, you know, just asking a very direct question if, you know, how is feedback received, constructive and affirming, you know, particularly if your direct report is, is the CEO or, or you are the CEO, you know, working with a board or whatever level you are in the organization. Understanding that gives me very, um, uh, the response to that clues on how open and collaborative a place can be you know, and, and even speaking back to like, you know, the clarification, I, I think asking the questions of how people deal with challenges, how are problems solved, and who's involved in that is very telling. And, you know, you have to understand like what you need, you know, and to be able to, to compare that. But I think that's an interesting one. Yeah, I love that. I um, kind of along those lines, the one around decision making. Um, I think is an important one to ask. Um, part of that is also just, you know, clarifying that we both have an understanding of what the role is, right? So asking about how decisions are made in the organization and the expectation of how decisions are made within my area of what I'm doing, right? Um, and, and hearing what that person expects or, you know, how they talk about decision making. Um, that's one that for me um, has worked in sort of the little red flags going off when it feels a little too insular. I'll just again go back to the investigate, investigate, investigate. Yeah. Talk to people who work there and to um, the other question. If someone takes a role and they leave shortly thereafter, I don't think it looks bad on the person who left shortly thereafter. Right? That's true. That is so true. <laughs> um, so talk to people who have worked there. Um, you know, don't call me after you accepted the job. Like, call me before so we can talk about it. Um, use your network. Look at the website. Like, learn as much as you can about um, how the, op the organization operates um, before you sort of commit yourself. Um, and I think, you know, it's just like in an interview process, um, Everybody's on the first date. Everybody's trying to, you know, put their best, you know, their representative forward. So it really is a, a challenge sometimes. Um, and I know I had, a, I had an interesting interview um, where someone on the interview team kind of walked me out and said, look, this is what's kind of like really going on, but it's really a great place and you really should want to come here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you can appreciate that and make your own decisions after that. But I think, you know, we just have so much more information now. You know, pe folks have a web presence. We have social media. Those things, you know, um, back in the old days when I was interviewing, you know, you just didn't have that. And so, and I, th I think people appreciate being asked. I think, you know, people are, I think, very, very loath to sort of trash a place. But I think that people will tell the truth, and I think that that's important. 
Yeah. And one more thing before we get to our, our next question here that I also feel like we need to say is that some of this stuff takes practice, right? Like it just takes practice with every interview you do and with every interaction. Um, you know, I'll say for myself, like I, it was very, felt very late in my, my career life when I finally felt like I had the confidence to ask those questions point blank, right? Um, and even to the point of like deciding to the, the walk away or to say no to a job, right? Um, so I also just wanna make sure that we know, like we're not sharing this as if it's an easy thing to suddenly yeah. come at. Um, it is sometimes something that takes practice, but hopefully if we're doing that early enough, then we can get better at it and move through that faster. I also, I would love to just add, I, there is also the other piece of this where challenges will come up, you know, particularly in these times where companies, there, are, there, are so, there is so much uncertainty in planning and futures and positions and all that. Like there is something to, as much as you can, um, stand, you know, or like as much as you can take on and tolerate to walk through that challenge and see and see what you learn from it on the other side. I mean, I had to reframe, you know, stepping into an organization in 2021 was going to be hard no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> so like add on, you know, the stretch and the onboarding and the learning, you know, there were several challenges. And in this year, 2023 for me is like a reframing of everything. Every challenge is an opportunity to learn everything from a more positive and gratitude perspective to, to have the privilege to, to be in that space. I'm not saying to take things that go and cross your boundaries, but you have to start to define what those things are for you. You know what you can tolerate. You know what you're wanting to learn and, and gain from an opportunity. So I don't think we're, we're advocating for either side of just like, you know, quit immediately or like stay until you can't take it. <laughs> but like you have to start to define that for yourself. And, and then take the networking advice that you get about companies with a grain of salt, because we're all human. We all bring our own you know, opinions and biases into things. And the more data you can collect, um, the better the information. I think we have one final question before we wrap up here. This question is from JR Nexus Russ. Can you talk about how important exit interviews are when black and Latinx folks do leave despite the best efforts in order to be open to and learn about ways your organization may have failed them and do better? Exit interviews are very important. And uh, it's uh, make sure that you're, you have specific goals for sharing a perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and, and think about what is the lasting message you want to leave? Not necessarily that, that the experience may have been uh, uh, not consistent with uh, the op overall, uh, what one would expect, but making sure that it can be a learning experience for the organization. Uh, you know, there, there are times when uh, a, a, a situation and an individual's perspective don't align, that happens. Or there are just times where it's an, another opportunity in terms of moving on. You know, there's nothing, I, mean, I think that's, that's appropriate. But uh, use that time wisely and perhaps, uh, uh, and respectfully. And, uh, and if you have a, uh, a, a fundamental concern about the organization, make sure that you are taking steps to communicate that properly. I just wanna say one thing about yeah. that. So I would, to the managers and the hiring uh, managers in the room, start asking for some retention interviews because to me, exit interviews mm -hmm. are sure. great and necessary for those who are moving on and certainly for the organization to learn, um, but it's too late, right? It's too late. So I think having those conversations about your satisfaction in your role, like do you want growth? Like building that relationship with your manager or the person who can advocate for you or yourself um, if you're advocating, like that, build that into your work because it's necessary, right? Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, that's also the responsibility of the organization, not mm -hmm. just, and I know the question is not as much for the organization, but you know, that's, sure. that's the responsibility to take in those, um, what you learn from those exit interviews, and also collectively, right? I think sometimes, too, organizations will focus on like that one person's 
who's leaving that role that you're looking to fill and what their perspective was. But there are patterns that you can see along the way. And I think, too, to your point of it around the retention um, interviews, right, or having these um, interviews along the way, there are things that you can find um, if you are listening for them. Right? I think somebody said that at one of the panels, too. I think it was one of the consultants who very smartly said that, right? Um, the consultants are sharing things with you um, that are either new to you or that you just haven't been hearing. Um, so for those of you who have that, um, that, that power within your organization to change those practices, those policies, to really affect change in that, really listen, really look through, and really pay attention to that. So unfortunately, we only have just a couple more minutes here. Um, and I wanted to close with just final thoughts from our panel here. I really strongly believe that in order for us to change and to grow, it usually means the letting go of something, the, the leaving out of something, right? Um, if you have plants, you know, you got to take care of the dead leaves, dead branches. Sometimes you have to cut the healthy ones, too, in order for it to grow fuller and stronger. And so with that idea in mind, I wanted to ask the three of you, and we'll start with Yvette and um, make our way down, uh, what is one thing that organizations can let go of and one thing that they need to start doing in order to ensure that they can um, create a space and an environment to uh, retain uh, this incredibly talented group of black and Latina leaders? Okay, stop hoarding power. Um, <laughs> let's start with that. Um, and um, what, what could they start doing? I mean, they could start um, listening, like actively listening um, and empowering and allowing those around them, whatever their title, whatever their place in the organization, to lead, to lead from their space. I think we need to start setting up a pipeline for the future, right? It's not always about bringing people in. It's like letting people grow within an organization um, and letting people take the lead. Excellent advice. Um, I mean, I think we just have to give each other a break. I mean, I really like, I, I do think um, that we're on navigating some really sort of interesting times and tricky waters right now. Um, and I think, you know, having an organization that is committed to sort of being a learning organization and continuing to figure out the best way to operate and to, to open up um, opportunities for people to share um, what they're thinking and what they're learning and what their experience is in an organization I think is really, really important. Um, but more and more, you know, I just feel like it's so important that we have compassion um, for one another. Um, in particularly in certain situations, and that's something that I'm certainly um, working on and focusing on because I think that was a big lesson many of us learned during the pandemic, and that we can continue to sort of bring that into our continuing work. Like we were able to be flexible and nimble and change things around quite a bit during the pandemic, and a lot of that stuff we can keep. Wonderful. Make sure that uh, we understand the cycles with underway within our organizations, and when it's time to to uh, to let go, mm. and uh, to create space for the organization to continue to evolve, because that's really healthy. It's healthy for all involved, and it's something that we can't just talk about, but we must act upon. Thank you so much for your wonderful words, insights, thoughts um, on this topic. Thank you all for joining us in this conversation uh, and listening. Thank you to Sphinx and to our fantastic team that helped get us on the stage and prepared for this conversation and kindly reminding us of the time. <laughs> so thank you all. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Appreciate it.